Hey everybody, welcome back to your Razor Academy where we do this thing called Learn Dota where we try and come every single week, it has been a while since my last video, but we try and come every single week to have a bit of a chat about Dota, uh, mainly Dota 2, obviously that's the game which I'm involved in the most in, and uh, yeah, this is now week 7, there was a short break as I said where, uh, well basically I was busy recovering and a whole bunch of other stuff, and at least now you can see I'm actually wide awake and ready to go. So uh, let's actually do something... A little bit different, but actually what I've done before. Now, I had a request from one user, and this is going to be our main thing for today. I'm going to find him right now, uh, because I had his little quest up here. Uh, it's from a man whose name is very hard to pronounce, but I think it's uh, Mav Mavis Mavisic? He spells it with a four. It's stupid. Um, but love you anyway, man. Uh, he's asking the question, can we go back through old replays? So just find a random replay and just have a, have a talk about it and just see these little details which can help you become a better gamer. So that's going to be our main thing for today. So I've, I've grabbed a random replay from somewhere in the world of the Dota, Dota TV cyberspace, and we're going to be having a look at that today. There are a couple of other questions, as we always do at the start of these videos. We go through questions which you post in the comment section below, and I will try and answer them as best I can. Um, one one of the questions was, um, when it comes to the uh, Dota competitive scene, does countries matter? This came in from uh, Jazz Devil, who was hoping his topic will be chosen. Congratulations, man. It was. Um, do countries matter when you try and get to competitive level? In a way, yes. In a way, no. There's uh, a couple of things which will probably uh, influence it, and that would be ping going into major servers or just time zones. For instance, I was from Australia. I now live in Germany. But because I live in Germany, I'm in the time zone of CEST, which majority of the current Dota 2 tournaments are run on. Most tournaments are run on the European time zone. Americans wake up early, Australians stay up late. Same with Asia. Uh, but you can, if you're from down south, um, you can be looking into into competitions from Asia. There's a couple of them out there right now. Uh, you might be uh, lucky enough to get in some of the big competitions. If not, there's always some small ladders here and there. North America always has their American competitions as well. I believe It's Goes Who runs a really nice one at this point. But that's, of course, one of those invite-only kind of things as well. So you've got to try and find the big open competitions that you can join and you can compete in, and then you can get yourself seen, then you get yourself in the bigger competitions. Or if you just want to play with your friends, just have some good fun. There are some good competitions are out there, but you've got to find the ladders and the in-house leagues and that's very country specific. Each country will have a little bit more infrastructure as far as Dota goes because of what happened in Dota 1. And some of it's going to be pretty new as well because Dota 2 is a new game. It's still in beta. It hasn't come out yet. So you might have to try and look a little bit like deeper into finding these small communities and find the one which suits you the best. Um, well, next question we had. Uh, what do we got? What do we got? What do we got? So a uh, question that came through from uh, Marco John. I don't know how you say your name or not. Um, and his question is mainly, what made me choose Dota 2? There was one thing which he said was missing from my last episode, because in the last episode I talked about Hon, Dota, LOL, and all that kind of shizzle, and how the entire genre kind of came together. If you want to check that out, you can do so. It's on the Cold of Razor YouTube channel. Uh, you can find it all there. Or if you're on the Razor Academy website, hello to you as well. You found the website. Well done. Um, but yeah, the reason why I chose Dota 2, or the Dota genre, over majority of other things, I actually like to play multiple games. I'm a first-person shooter guy at heart, but what I really am at heart is a really competitive guy. It even happens when I'm playing pub games, I will always be massively competitive. I want to win. It's just what happens. I do have a tendency to rage a little bit when it comes to that kind of stuff, um, but generally I can keep myself under control. <laughs> you just don't drink and put yourself on a live stream. That gets a little bit more iffy. Uh, but yes, I'm a competitive player at heart, and if it comes down to anything where you, where you want to be focused and you want to have four other people who will generally be focused as well, Dota 2 kind of gives me that. It, it gave me that element. I always love team-based play. I love relying on other people and, then, and having them rely on me when it comes to a game. So that's why I like team-based play instead of like the solo kind of StarCraft 2 kind of stuff, because then it's just like, well, I'm playing by myself, and that's a little bit depressing for me. I like playing with other people. I like having fun with other people, and I like winning with other people. So I look for that competitive edge, and if you look for people who are the most competitive, Dota people are pretty much up there. Like, they're, they're full on. If they don't win, they slit their wrists and then go home like crying. It's just not what they want to do. It's, they, they will strive to win every time, or if they do lose, they'll find something funny or hilarious to do in the manner of the way they lost. So they'll find a stupid hero to play or a stupid build to go. Something along those lines. So that's kind of why I like Dota 2 above everything else. Uh, I do, of course, I love my Call of Duty. Uh, not the recent ones, but I do like Call of Duty and some Battlefield. I was Battlefield and Call of Duty to start with, so yeah, I, I enjoy those kind of things. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, 
I'm also going to go through a, a question from Mudkippy. Mudkippy asked me, how do I creep stack? Um, I'm going to remember this one a little bit later on because I want to jump now into uh, the wonderful Water Dota 2 so we get to show you that and we can take my ugly face off the screen for a while. You'll notice as well from our last episode, this has had a couple of changes. So uh, you'll see that the map is actually exactly the same, but it's the HUD which has been changed around, and a couple of really cool features. And let me just, um, I'm going to slow this down to absolutely nothing. I should be able to do this in replays. Yeah, I can. Where we can draw on the map. Now, this is going to be insanely helpful when I'm trying to teach you some stuff. And the main reason why is because if we want to, oh, wow, is that really not going to let me do that? Let me just pause that so I can move properly. Um, if I want to actually talk about these creep cams, I can draw on these guys. And that's what I really love. So uh, let's actually look at the very, very start. Now, what I want to go through, and this is something which I don't think I've actually covered, is the starting items of a hero. Now, I chose this one because it actually, there's different ways and different approaches that I've already got from these first couple of heroes from the dire side. And the reason why I like it is this guy, more positive 72. Now, this can be a bad, a bad, bad thing, or it could be absolutely amazing. It all depends on your start. When you start off, you've got your set amount of gold. So you're 603. It's what you love to play with at the start of every single game. This Crystal Maid hasn't bought a single thing. 603 gold is what you have. What you buy with that is then up to you as a person. And how you do this is you work out what role you're going to play and then what items you need to support that. So we look at Marana, and Marana's instantly gone with a bottle. Now, this takes up 600 of her 603 starting gold. Now, the reason why I kind of like this and why I'm also iffy about this is most of the time, if you run here in the middle lane, you will be ganked up. There will be something that will go horrendously wrong with you um, because you'll just get ganked from the sides. It's too easy just to move around the sides here and then come in towards the middle lane. It's a very, very dangerous world to be in. Uh, so Mirana going early bottle, while it's great because you can regenerate your health as well as your, as well as your mana, um, you get three charges in the bottle, you can refill it up, um, either by returning back to base here, or picking up one of the runes and I'll spawn on zero minutes and every two minutes after that. Uh, and that's what this build is really centered around. If you do not control these runes, and we're going to watch this as we go along as well, if you do not control the runes, then this build kind of fails because you don't have extra strat stats. Mana pool is 221, and you got 473 in your HP pool, and that is not a lot. That's a very easy gank in the middle lane if you get caught out. And it's going to be a hard enough lane as it is because she's either going up against a burst damaging Zeus or an invoker to go solo mid. That would be the initial thought when you look at this. You go, they're the two heroes which will probably end up facing up against me in mid. Now we can look at anti-mage. Anti-mage hasn't finished buying his items just yet. We might let him uh, go a little bit slower. So uh, he can finish buying up his items if he's going to. Um, but you can see him there, Stout Shield as well as Tango. So because of the Stout Shield and Tango, he knows he's going to be on the front lines of battle. And that means that, well, he's got to try and deal with all this harassment that will be coming his way. And he knows harassment's going to be coming his way as, wow, really? We're on directed camera? Well, no, no, no we're not auto-speeding. Let me give, give me a free camera. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, as you can see, Andy Mage up here on the top lane hasn't actually spent all of his money. Bought up Tango's, bought up Stout Shield. Now, you, be, you can be looking at this in multiple ways. You can go, well, man, you need extra consumables. You need more stats. You need something if you want to try and survive on this top lane. But then he can look and say, you know what? I got a CM as well as an Ancient Apparition. That's good support for me. So I don't have to worry too much if things go definitely astray because I'm going to have that support. And maybe I can rush up and get a Ring of Health very early on as well. Because by getting that, then he has that consistent regen, can work towards the Battle Fury, and that's a nice thing to rush. But it's at the expense of his, his starting life points, which is something which you've got to be very, very careful about, and you rely heavily on your supports. Let's have a look over at the Radiant side in the meantime. So we'll see what builds we got up from these guys. And Invoker as well as Zeus have bought absolutely nothing but Skeleton King we can talk about. Now you see Quelling Blade up on him, as well as a lot of consumables. One Clarity Potion, as well as a Hellfire Blast. Now, this is a really nice build from an SK. As you can see, from Russia, so we should expect him to be aggressive. Quelling Blade, giving that extra percentage chance to get those last hits in, so he wants a farming build out of this one. He knows he's going to kind of need it as well, but funnily enough, with the four heroes which are selected for the Radiant side, it's a very farm-intensive lineup. 
So they've got to make sure they get every single last hit possible. And that's where the Quelling Blade with that bonus 32%, it's a melee bonus, really comes into play. And it's a nice way to also clear through trees if you're going to be pulling, if you're going to play that support role, then he might do that as well. Because he's going to be wanting to pull up this way here. And this creep camp you want to grab, and then send down this way. And then you can pull the aggro, and it'll, it'll go both ways. But what you want to do is you can remove out this little tree here, and then pull this camp down this way. And then the aggro which you've got from the, from the creep wave up here will then be pulled up directly up into this camp. So you basically get a double farm, but you've got to remove off the trees. You don't always want to have to use a tango, you can use a quelling blade to do so. Uh, but that's one way of doing it. But SK is hitting bottom lane, and more than likely, as everyone does in the pub world, they want to get a crap load of farm, and this is going to let them do it. How are we looking as far as other, other items? So we've got Axe now coming in towards the mix-up. I'm going to... Uh, we'll go to his build in a couple of moments, but we'll look at the uh, Crystal Maiden. Also note, not a single courier purchase just yet. Normally that is the role of a support, so if you're playing a support role, please, with the love of God, buy a courier. Um, you'll also notice Lena's got a little bit of extra money. That's because she randomed. So because she randomed, as you can see, randoms Lena, you get bonus gold. So she spent 140 out on that one, you can do your math from that, and you can work out how much money she actually has. Uh, so because of the random 503, or you can just bo boost yourself up to basically an insane amount of gold. Zeus is sitting there, 703 gold. How much do you want to do with that? You get so much more money, but you don't control what hero you get. So that is your downside. And it's generally those people who will buy up the courier. In this case, however, it looks like, um, I think SK must have randomed as well, judging by the amount of money he got. Yeah, he random SK. And he bought up a courier. So he got that extra money, and he puts it into a courier. So if you do random and you get a hero that's not going to work well for your team, then you buy up the courier. That is just what you should do as a person to help your team go along. Now, this build from Invoker, if you ever want to go on Invoker, this is a build for stability. Every, every, this is actually the really cool thing. Whenever you look at the starting items, you can go whatever you want to as far as any build. But Invoker, he's gone Quas to, to start with. So an insane amount of mana regen, as uh, we'll just bring it up here so you can see it. So H regen, uh, HP regen goes up by one. Bonus strength up by, by two. So your HP gets higher, and your regeneration stays up. Which means any harassment you'll generally take on a lane will be easily countered by anybody. Well, I was casting a game earlier today, and it was Puck up against an Invoker. An Invoker's sitting there with about nine... Nine points of HP per second being regenerated and Puck's in there with 1.4. And that's sometimes the huge difference you can have when you go for a course build. And then he's going to grab up a gauntlet as well as a circlet. Now, this can be done to go into drum. So this is preparation <laughs> from your starting item. So let me just pause this one and we'll bring up our shop. So when you think about it, you go, okay, I'm going to go with my starting items. Where am I going to go with these items? Am I going to go grab like a gauntlet and a circle and just get a brace and just say, yay, I have a bracer and that's all I want to do? Or do you go, well, a gauntlet, I can pick that up and then I could go and earn or I could go into Drums of Endurance because that's what a bracer helps me build to. So Drum of Endurance and the Rover Magi as well as the recipe for 750. But having the bracer early on with a course build means I can live a lot more. And the movement speed kick in later on can be really, really big for the chase because you want to be able to keep up with people when you get that level up on Cold Snap, which is also the advantage of going with a course build. You can get that Cold Snap very, very early on. And because of that, drums is a nice way to go. This isn't the normal build for an invoker, however. Most invokers, if they're going to be playing in a competitive match, will try and go a little bit more aggressive from the damage from their right click and might even try and make the most of, an, of Exhort. So they level up Exhort, and that gives them even more damage, and they get Blades of Attack with Boots and get the Phase Boots. So then you go Phase Boots and Drums. Your movement speed is actually quite insane. Some people are used to combine it with the Yule Scepter as well, because the Yule Scepter will give you even more movement speed, and running away from Invoker becomes impossible. An Invoker will want to have that movement speed when he's going to chase after a Leaping Mirana, after a Blinking Anti-Mage, and the other three, well, he can, just, he can just chase them down and kill them pretty easily anyway. So uh, let me just give this a little bit of... Um, go back to our, to our normal speed. So one second, so we can roll back out. Zeus walking around with double gauntlet, so he's more than likely wanting to go a more aggressive build. So as I said, you can go with a gauntlet, and that can go into something else in the future. So he's probably going to look at an urn. But for now, gives him good life. He has some regeneration for, for, through, through the tangos. So that's life regeneration up, and a double clarity. Surprisingly though, and this is something which you might want to do when you go Zeus, you shouldn't really go level one bolt. 
Try going level 1 Arc Lightning instead. The bolt is great if you spam it up later, but you need to have the levels up on it because it's such a mana intensive spell. You, you're going to cost 75 mana when you pop that little sucker off. So that's a decent amount of mana to be used, and for some reason, I don't know why CM is the only one here in the middle lane. I'm pretty sure that's going to change in a moment. Yeah, we've got Marana coming down here, so finally. But uh, to have Zeus walking around with a bolt, you can pop that on the Crystal Maiden, but you're going to deal 100 damage to a 565 HP hero. And that's because you've got a gauntlet as well, a circle as well. Not the most standard build for a CM, but she can work with it. Uh, but because of this, then you're going to go, what is the point of a bolt? Where I could use Chain Lightning to trigger off and get the last hits. And that's the big thing for Zeus. He doesn't have to come in close to do this right click. And Zeus' animation for right clicking is not the best in the world. It's slow, My it's stagnant, Zeus. and you kind of just get really annoyed with it after a while. But there's that Arc Lightning, and hopefully he's going to do it right now on this creep here. So, um... He's just doing his last thing for now, but that's, it's good harassment when it comes down to hitting Marana. Because she can level up, and I, I kind of like doing this with Zeus. I won't even go Bolt on level 2. I'll put Arc Lightning, and you keep it at level 1, because the mana cost is pretty low, 65. Double jumps damage. 5 times, so that's decent enough, and 85 damage. But what the biggest thing about it is, is this little thing. The Static Field. So the health reduc reduction, the range, and Zeus will shock all nearby enemies in that 1,000 range. At level 1, the range doesn't change. But causes the damage proportional to the current health of the opponent. And you keep doing that, and it brings them down bit by bit. And that 1,000 range is actually pretty intense. So you've got to look at that and think, well, how can I chain it? How can I continue harassment? And you're seeing Zeus now forced to hold back, and he's probably not going to be the highest up in CS. 4-1 to one right now against Murano, who's actually got 0-0, zero for zero, so Zeus is actually having a good time. Could be because Murano was a little bit late. But that's just one of those things where you can look at that and go, well, maybe something for the future for me to look at. Let's try going Arc, and there's that static field. So he ends up going 1-1-1. One, one, one. There's nothing wrong with the build, it's just everybody has a different way of going about it. He wants to be aggressive. That's the reason he's got the gauntlets. That's the reason why he wants to get the urn. But it's just one of these things where maybe early game, it doesn't really work as well for me and give me that advantage I need to get the farm I need to build up and earn. It's not that easy to do so. Pudge is also walking around with a gauntlet of strength. Not bad for him standing on a lane when they've got two melees on the top. But you've got to be careful about doubling up on this urn. I keep on mentioning the urn. If you don't know what an urn is, by the way, um, well, we can actually look it up for you right here. So it's the urn of shadows. Basically, every single time someone dies near you, an enemy that is, you will gain two charges on your urn. This can be used to heal, or it can be used to damage. So casting it on an on ally will cause them to gain life. Casting it on, on an enemy will cause them to lose life. But you have to be the closest person by. If you have two urns, it doesn't just stack up. It's not like a magic wand where you get a charge every single time an enemy pops off an ability. It doesn't work that way, because you could have like three wands there and you're all getting charges. But with the urn, it only gives it to the person who is the closest to the kill. So if you stack up on the urns, it's not a bad item. Like you get decent strength, you've got some mana regen in it as well. So it's not a bad item to go with. But it's just one of these things where you shouldn't really multiply how many times you have it. Because if you do that, then you're not really going to make the most of that item. And you can look towards something else. You can buy up another support item which will do the job. And give you those stats that you require or want. Even the SK has got it right now. But he's just going to build towards a bracer. Which is easy enough for him to do. So now let's, let's actually go up to a, to a normal speed. So we can see how this goes. So let's, let's watch our rune control. So it's two minutes in. We've got a Direward watching the bottom. We've got a Direward watching the top. And Marana's running nothing but raw bottle. So is she going to make that move? She's harassing back. Still got all these bottle charges up. And she's going to take a little bit of damage from this. And now she'll go up and pick up that rune. So using off one of those bottle charges. Can use the second one and then pick up the rune. There's that little static field as I was talking about. That 1,000 range on it. Absolute pain in the butt for anybody. But Marana doesn't want to leave this lane. I think she, she fears too much that she's going to lose the farm. But when it comes down to rune control, most teams will not let you leave this guy here for too long. By leaving this rune here, and the fact they've actually got vision of it means they know that that rune is there. If you leave it there for too long, especially past the 4 minute mark, you lose out of control. You lose out an extra bottle charges you could actually have. But I think Marana just doesn't want to leave until she has low enough life that she can do so. So we'll watch it, and we'll want to know if, if between, between now and the next 30 seconds 
She goes and grabs it. Because this is the important thing. If you're going to build up items at the very, very start of a game, make sure it goes into something more in the game. So popping off an arrow. Zeus will get nothing from this right now, but also he could be running a bottle as well. He's used little to know of his, none of his consumables. Marana hasn't been really aggressive as well. And she can be because she has that bottle. And she's going to miss it too, so the, the rune won't change. You don't change up runes, you don't get extra runes that spawn up. If you hit that four minute mark and the rune hasn't been taken, then the rune will just remain. That's just what happens. So that's three bottle charges that Marana could have had, as well as three illusions. Now as far as that helping with last hits, it could work out kind of nicely. And now we'll just, we'll just speed it up a little bit. So we'll go two times the pace. I just want to see if anybody does make a jump for that rune. Because we can go through this pretty fast anyway. It's a wonderful thing about, about having a replay. So trying to go with aggression for the arrow. Still using up that mana. Hasn't used the next bottle charge. And now we'll make the run. And by the time she gets here, Pudge is here as well. We'll grab the illusion rune and you find yourself... Now you'd be going, crap. If I had that illusion rune, I could have picked that up. I could have popped that... Short test of faith is going to get nothing from that whatsoever because he doesn't have a bottle, he can't store it himself, and that's not the refresh of it all. But there's a lot more abilities that Marana is capable of spamming out if you grab that rune. So I'm just going to say, if you have a bottle, rune control for your entire team is worth it. And you do rely a little bit on your supports to make sure you have the vision. Like these guys here, that's done by the support heroes. And you've got to say, the supports for the dire side, they've done their job right for the runes to go with the strat that Marana was thinking of. The downside right now is this bottom lane. But they, they're just relying on their stuns and their intimidation factor to hold off against the Enigma, uh, the um, Invoker as well as the SK. So let's see if, how many runes Marana gets. So she's got nothing so far. And the next rune spawns up in 30 nice seconds try. time. In fact, let's just focus on that because we're just going to look at that for, the, for this uh, entire game. And just the ability the runes give you. So we've got another 10 seconds now before the rune's going to spawn up. You notice too, still Pudge's illusions of watching that top rune for him. And six minutes now comes up as Invis on the top. First boss build in bottom lane, but that's not now important thing. We want to watch Marana. So now the Invis rune. So you got Invis, pops a bottle charge. You can do that as well. So for those guys who are just like wondering what's going on, like you pop Invis and then you pop a bottle charge. Shouldn't that actually cancel out the Invis? If you pop it fast enough, once you trigger the invisibility, you can get one charge of a bottle out. You can't get more than that because if you pop it again, then you're going to be in a little bit of trouble. But you can get that out. And now using this Invis rune is able to rotate up, has a mana for an arrow, and this should be a kill in the top lane. There's already been two kills go the way of, uh, go the, way of the Radiant side. And that's a bit of a problem for them, and maybe a little bit too long in the wait. Could have thrown out that arrow a little bit sooner. Anyway, should jump in and go fun from there. But it's just those deaths which are happening. So it's Axe as well as Crystal Maiden. It's just on the bottom lane which, is this, is, which this is happening. But it's fair enough to you. You've got Cold, you got cold Snap, that, that ability I was telling you about before. Cast it on. Every time you take damage, you get stunned and held in place. And then you got SK with his stun. Harder stun as well, and this is the reason why he came down here with the Clarity Potion to start with. Because you see his mana pool of 247. You cast one stun. Sorry. There's action on the top lane. I can't help. It's like a default to look at this. But it's at least Lena going down. So they made the most of this. And the arrow just a little bit off to the side and Pudge commits suicide. That's always a painful thing to watch. Yeah. But I just want to pause this for a moment. Um, SK's mana pool. You need 280 in order to cast two stuns. And he's got a pool at level 6 of 273. And that just shows you how far out he is. And the biggest problem he has is it's not just for the Hellfire Blast. He's got that at level 3, so that's 140 mana. It's expensive. Takes off more than half his mana pool right now. But what makes it more difficult for him is his ultimate requires mana. So reincarnation will only work if you have 140 mana. So because of that, you then got to go, well, 140 mana, 140 stun. If I stun, I don't have my ultimate. Is my stun going to be worth it? Can I get a kill with that stun and also be happy that I'm going to live or at least my death won't be in vain? So that's the decision you got as an SK. One thing I want to point out as well is uh, just a game of trades. For those guys who always watch um, a whole bunch of Dota 2 live streams and they go, how do I kind of like know what team is winning? Like sure, you could bring up your goal graph, you'll see, or, uh, you'll see Radiant is ahead by 1,500. And as far as the experience goes, yeah, Radiant's ahead as well, 1,500. They're two kills up, so you have to say, that is worth it. Well done. But it's a game of trades. 
So it's worth it because we've got Zeus able to free farm up in the middle lane. There was two kills already in the bottom lane for SK as well as Invoker. It's the reason why SK is up at level 6 now and Axe is 5 and CM is only just about to pop 5. So that's not a good trade, but you look up towards the top lane and you check out the Anti-Mage. So as we, were, as we were expecting, he did rush up that Ring of Health. He also bought up the Boots of Speed. He wants to get that Battle Fury because they know late game, there is little to nobody on the orange side that can deal with SK, uh, uh, with, um, with Anti-Mage. SK would be the only one. I'm talking about Skeleton King, not Sand King. They're both called SK for short. Um, but Skeleton King might be the only one that could do it because of his ultimate. But the problem he's got is Anti-Mage burns the mana around. So he needs to have something which gives him that burst of mana before he's going to die. That's why some SKs decide to go with a soul ring. They sacrifice their own life but get mana back and that ensures them they'll get that ultimate off if the timing is right before they die. That's always the biggest problem. Um, it's not an easy thing, uh, easy thing to do. Andy Mage just loves going up against a Skeleton King at the end of the day because he can maneuver so much faster. It's just that stun and the damage. It's the crit which comes out from SK which sometimes is a little bit too much for the anti-mage to handle unless he gets a decent amount of farm very early on. Um, but yeah, this is the whole trade-off thing. So does anti-mage's farm balance out the rest of the game? They're already about to bring down the T1 tower on top, so that damage has been dealt. How much damage is dealt to the bottom tower? Nothing, absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. There's a little bit there, like 100 and 159 HP taken off the tower. Little to nothing compared to the 1,000 gold you will claim for your team if your team destroys the tower and, not, and it's not denied. So that's a big trade-off. Dota, in, in simple terms, is a game of trades. In simple, simple terms, it's you destroy this little guy. So you do, start it so I can actually draw, thank you. If you destroy this, so that's a fortress, that wins you the game. Here's the radiant one. Destroy that, you win the game. Tier 4 towers, tier 3 towers... Tier 2, Tier 1. They all become part of this trade system. If you take the tower, what do you get in return? If you get a kill, what do you get in return? Do you claim a tower for letting two of your heroes die? Do you gain map control by letting a Tier 1 tower take a fall? Like if this tower now goes down, Anti-Mage has got to walk in past this area here generally. And that opens up a new area to gank from. The rotation can come from this middle lane, just straight up through this way, and then come up and look for the area to gank. It's a long way for any mage to go down, so it's not too safe for him. And when you've got a pudge on the map that can hook you, and a nice little pudge spot, if you ever want to try it out, it's just here in this little, this little corner bush here, and you can hook straight out that way. And you can latch anybody that's basically here, but it requires a level 4 hook to get that kind of range. Uh, but it's, he's got a level 3 already, so... He can still look at that. So it's a dangerous world for anti-mage. You see him now just holding back. He was waiting for Pudge to push that lane, so now he can come back in and farm. So how does it go for trade? Does it trade you for map control? Does it trade you for towers? Does it trade you for gold? Is it experience trade you're looking for as well? There's just so many of these different things which you've got to try and balance up when you try and play a game of Dota. Is it good for me to push right now, or should I hold it back? Should I hold the creep wave as close to my tower as possible because I need a certain level of farm? before I can be the be-all, end-all, like, bees knees, ants, pants, about like a Zam kind of guy. Like, what am I supposed to have at that point? That's going to be a big thing which I'm going to leave everybody out there with uh, as our final thought for today. What do you do when you play Dota? How do you find your trade when you play a public game? Because it's not the easiest thing to do. Finding a trade when you play in public games never really works a lot because you're playing with people who don't really have one focus, unless you're actually talking actively to your team, and it's the best thing you can do. Say hello when you first start a game of Dota, because it's amazing how much more receptive people are going to be when you just say hello, and then you can work as a team. Sometimes it's going to be those people who say, I got solo mid and that's it. There's no more discussion about it, and then you've got to try and work your own little strat away, like around it all, to see how it works. It's, it's kind of why I like playing, it, like, I know a lot of people know I play Profit a lot, uh, and the main reason why is because Profit can be anything. He can be a jungler, he can be a ganker, he can be a pusher, and he can be a normal laner. He can even go side lane solo if he wants to. And this is a hero which can blend into everything. It's why people, I also like playing Venomancer as well. Um, I know a lot of people out there do like playing him as a support because he'd be a counter pusher, he could be an aggressor, he could be a team fight guy with his ultimate. And he is support, so he can also be the man to ward around the map while still getting some farm which you can use his wards for as well. So there's a lot of different features which you can add on top of each of your heroes and the way you play them to work with a team and to find that trade. 
That's going to be our final thought. As always, guys, if you have any questions which you want to have answered, I want to do a little bit more of this because I do actually enjoy doing this stuff as well, just passing on some knowledge which will help you guys play the game of Dota as opposed to just doing summary of genres, all that kind of stuff. It does become a little bit generic after a while. And as Dota changes over time, I want to help keep you guys up to speed with little things you can do to improve your game. So uh, thanks for tuning in today, guys. This is, of course, the Razor Academy. Please do check out all the other videos on the Cold of Razor YouTube channel. There's a lot, actually a lot of good stuff out of there. And um, I know I'm watching almost every single Razor Academy video and learning some stuff too at the same time. That's what it's all about. You learn. We also learn at the same time as well, so we don't know it all. I don't know it all. Believe me, I do not know it all. You can't know it all when it comes to Dota 2, but you can at least evaluate, make judgments, and try and work out what is better in the, in the future for you. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I'll catch you in next week's Razor Academy, which shouldn't be too far away, because I'm behind schedule. I want to do a couple more of these things for you, so the next Razor Academy week should not be too far away. I'll see you guys soon.